That Washington football team is really fucking good. Everything we do is going to be about winning. Okay, we're going to do things the right way, and that's the only way we're going to do them. Because if it doesn't help us, we're not doing it, man. That's just as simple as it gets. Win the Super Bowl. That's going to mean it, too. You know, I, I, one of the things that, that the only reason you become a head coach in this league, in my opinion, is to win. That's it. That's the bottom line. If you do it for any other reason, you're wrong. Hey, Washington football fans, welcome back. So, I was getting ready to, you know, review last Sunday's game after I've had a chance to watch it a few times now. And I get hit with, you know, enormous news of a player release. And it's a player that would really, really help out our team. So I start, you know, looking into his stats, you know, how healthy he's been, you know, comparing him with some other guys and and getting everything ready to do a video about that. And then, boom, another player gets released, another huge name player that would definitely fit into a role that we, we need. So here I am. Ready to make the video now, starting out. Before I do start out, can I get you guys to go ahead and uh, hit that like button down below, and click on subscribe, and hit that bell so you can come back for uh, all my videos on the uh, Washington football team and what's going on with them and around the league. So, since we're coming off a win, I'm going to start this video off on a positive note and say Taylor Heineke is pretty legit. Now, the competition he had wasn't that great. Atlanta is not a great team this year, but to have to lead his second game winning drive in four starts is pretty awesome. And he made a lot of big time plays to make it happen. He threw some passes into some tight windows. He got some nice chunks from Diami and, you know, Carter. And he showed an instant chemistry with Samuel. You know, he had so many nice connections with Terry McLaurin and like just in general, but he had the really sweet throw for a TD in the second quarter. He had a lot of scrambles that helped us move down the field. His TD pass to Terry, you know, when he was getting sacked was a thing of beauty. Just one of those amazing Hail Mary type plays. And you're just like, wow. And I know that play scared the hell out of Rico. And he said not to do it anymore. But don't listen to him, Taylor. Don't listen to him at all. I know it's a little sketchy on a first down, you know, with the game on the line. But... You bought enough time that Terry only has one guy close to him in the end zone. Chuck that thing up every time. Have faith in your number one guy. You know, and and that pass to DeAndre Carter was nice, too, to move down the field. It was like out of nowhere, 30 yards down the field, dropped it right over the defender. I mean, so many nice plays from Taylor. Finding Humphreys. For his obligatory late game chain mover to the sideline. But it was a much better throw this week. It was across the field, you know, 20 yards deeper than in the Giants game. And then the coup de gras, you know, keeping the play alive, getting outside the pocket and opening things up for McKissick before he comes back to him, you know, with that great game winning touchdown. Man. McKissick made an amazing play. But I don't think people are giving Taylor enough credit for what he did to make that play successful. Like, everybody knows that, you know, Taylor moving out kept the play going. But him scrambling out like that and keeping his eyes down the field and away from, you know, the play brought everyone's attention to that side of the field. And it cleared out a great lane for JD. 
you know, after he cleared, you know, Deion Jones, like he, he was off to the races. Like it was a wily vet type move coming from a guy in his fourth start. And that's the kind of stuff that's just got to make you so excited about Taylor Heineke. You know, that play showed a lot of growth. And uh, from being a guy that stares down a receiver too much to doing something, you know, all this work with his eyes, you know, to hold safeties and stuff, you just love to see that kind of advancement from week to week. And uh, this offensive line, this offensive line is playing great. You know, these are the two groups, like the only groups that I bragged about going into the season that are actually making me look like I know what I'm talking about because the D is doing awful. But that offensive line, I said it was going to be a lot better than anybody thought. And then this offense in general, I said we were going to be able to score points with these guys. A lot of us knew that, but, you know, we're actually looking like we know what we're talking about now. The defense just needs to step it up. Now, we lost Brandon Sheriff for at least a couple weeks, but I think, you know, we have the depth that, you know, it probably won't be an issue. We might lose Logan for a couple games. It's not really even confirmed that we're going to lose him for a game, but, you know, we could possibly lose him for a couple games with his his hamstring. But honestly, Logan has yet to be as productive as I expected. So I don't think it'll hurt us that bad seeing that we're already winning. And I think, you know, John Bates and Ricky Seals Jones can make up for what we were getting out of Logan. And hopefully uh, De'Ami Brown won't be out long because uh, with Samuel back, I think it's going to open things up even more for him. And uh, like we could, we could, see some serious production with all three of them on the field as soon as the army's healthy. But at least, you know, we'll get a chance to see how Dax Milne looks. I love Dax Milne. And, and with Brown and Sims possibly being out, we'll get a chance to look at him. You know, we have great depth on the offense as a whole, and it's, it's leading us to success from Taylor coming in as a backup after an injury and still being able to win games and possibly winning a starting job, you know, we've been able to play, you know, well without our number two wide receiver, Curtis Samuel, until now. And uh, with him back, we still have guys to step up when we lose our wide receiver three and wide receiver four, you know. And keeping four tight ends on the roster is showing to be a smart move too. I mean, the wide receiver group looks great. I think even losing Brown and Sims, the offense is really going to step up with Samuel coming in for a second week. You know, he he looked like he had instant chemistry with Taylor. And I think him and Terry are just going to look crazy out there next week. Uh, Like, the Saints don't know what's coming. (laughs) With all that great stuff about how the offense played, this game was way, way too close. There's no reason Atlanta should have moved the ball on us the way they did. I thought we actually looked better, you know, in some areas defensively, defending some some really good passes from Matt Ryan. You know, we timed our pressure pretty well, but then we completely shit the bed in an area that we had been doing amazing at. Through the first few weeks, we hardly missed any tackles. I think we had less than 10 missed tackles. And then we come into this game and miss somewhere in the neighborhood of five, you know, so we half of our our missed tackle total for the year in one game. It's crazy. You know, we still have the third fewest in the league. And I just hope it's something that doesn't continue, you know. We also, we pushed up to 41 pressures on the season giving us the third the third most. We just aren't converting them to sacks like we need to be. You know, we're tied for 10th in fewest rushing yards per attempt. You know, but we're the fourth worst in passes completed. So, 
we've also given up the third most passing first downs and the third most first downs in general. Tied for 10th worst passing yards per attempt. Tied for 12th most yards per play. So we can see our defense struggles come from pass coverage. And speaking of converting pressures into sacks, that rough in the passer call was the most horrendous call I've ever seen. Shit like that is exactly why Chase was scared to actually tackle him while his arm because his arm had started going forward. He was so worried about not getting a roughing the passer call that it led to a ugly play and he got one anyway. It was ridiculous. These officials have defensive players so worried about getting flagged over a play that it's ruining the game. Something has to be done. Like, that should have been a sack. You know, technically, and if the rules weren't shitty, it would have been a proper sack. Chase would have been able to feel confident enough to tackle the quarterback without worrying about hurting his team. The refs really tried to take this game away from us, but we got it out somehow. And man, the refs were so salty that they couldn't take the game away from us. I'm pretty sure they swatted Ryan Vermillion. Like, come on, that's a little little crazy that that happened right after that. Okay, okay. So maybe it didn't happen that way, but the refs did a horrible job. You know, we came out of this game with quite a few injuries, which sucks. And we only know the extent of the worst ones, like McTyre and Bostic, both out for the season. We don't know if Logan's hamstring is going to cost him any time at all or, or how much it will. Sheriff's going to be out two to three weeks with a sprained MCL. Hopefully, Diami's knee and Cam's hamstrings aren't serious. We definitely have the depth to deal with the wide receiver and offensive line, you know, injuries and be okay for a while. But with two guys possibly being out, it might be, you know, it might not be a bad idea to re-sign Steve Sims to the, you know, to the team. He's sitting on the Steelers practice squad right now. We could re-sign him to the team if, you know, Diami or Cam are going to miss a considerable amount of time, you know. And plus, I mean, if we sign him to the team, we can waive him and he'll probably make it back to our practice squad. So, yeah, Steve Sims had, a, you know, really good chemistry with Taylor in the playoff game last year. So, if we do need to bring a guy in, I mean, he'd be a good guy to bring in. And I thought we needed linebacker help before Bostic went down. Now we definitely need it more than ever. I thought Sha- Shaquem Griffin would be a perfect piece to add to this linebacking core, and I still do. Like, he should have Mayo or Norris's spot 100%. His speed and ability at linebacker is like a perfect fit. Plus, he's amazing, amazing at special teams. He uses that 4-3 speed to get down the field before the ball's even there, basically. This is a guy that should be on the team. But, that said, in our darkest time at linebacker, the hand of God reaches out to help us from the most unlikely of places. Dallas cut Jalen Smith. One of the best linebackers in the league and a perfect fit for what we need. Jalen was a a former five-star recruit, Butkus Award winner. This previous free agency, a lot of, you know, Washington football team fans were clamoring to try to get, you know, 31-year-old perennial great linebacker Levante David. But he's got to be in the twilight of his career where you got a guy in Smith that's 
26, going into his fifth season, and he's playing stride for stride with, you know, first team and two times second team All Pro, Pro Bowl, Super Bowl champ Levante David. Through the first three years as a full time starter, after overcoming his horrible injury at the Fiesta Bowl, one of many reasons. Any NFL evaluator that holds setting out against a draftable player is a complete idiot because shit like that happens. Jalen spent his rookie season healing and rehabbing, and he was slowly worked in, you know, with six games the following year. And then he hit the ground running as a full time starter in 2018, and he hasn't looked back since. He started all 16 games the last three years. He's been playing 95% of the defensive snaps and about 20% of the special team snaps on top of that. Any and all injury concerns are a thing of the past with him. He's not in Dallas anymore because they paid Dak in an insane amount of money and then they lucked out, you know, with two great linebackers in the draft, pure and simple. They couldn't afford him and they lucked into players that could replace him. So they're just trying to find, you know, save some cap space any way they can. They turned down Van Der Esch's fifth year option already, and they'll probably lose him in free agency too. But if you look at Jay- Jalen, his production, and you compare it to Levante David and Deion Jones, two of the best linebackers in the NFL. And then also account for the fact that these are the first three years as a starter for him compared to, you know, some of the prime years with Levante David and Deion Jones in the last three years. If you do that, then, like, these numbers are even more impressive. So let's look at the numbers here as far as solo tackles go. Jalen's got 254. Levante's only got four more with 258. And Deion Jones is back there with 175. This is over the last three years, these stats are. So a lot more tackles than Deion Jones and four less than Levante David. All pro, pro bowl, Super Bowl champion, Levante David. And then in the assist department, Jalen's leading the pack with 163 to David's 102, and Deion Jones is 94. And if you you put that together, that just means that that Jalen is always around the ball. Like, he is always in on the play compared to the other guys. QB hit, he had 13. Levante had 17, Dion had 14, tackles for loss, he had 17, Levante David doing it big with 35, and Dion with 18, one more than Jalen. He had eight eight forced fumbles to Levante David's uh, seven, and Dion's two. Uh, He had, uh, Jalen had Eight sacks to Levante's six sacks and Dion's five and a half sacks. Fumble recoveries, he had five uh, out of. He forced four and recovered five. So that's pretty good. Um, Levante David recovered five and uh, Dion. Deion Jones forced two and recovered two. Jalen actually returned one for a touchdown. And he has 43 yards on interception returns. Oh, he has two interceptions. Levante has two interceptions. And Deion has five. Deion actually had three pick sixes. So, out of his five interceptions. So, he's doing a little better in that department. But then you look at their um, their completion percentage against, or completion average against. 
Jalen's at 75.6. Levante David's at 72.6. And uh, Dion is at a crazy low 68. So you could also look at, at Jalen's numbers from the last three years, and they got better every year. This is just the average of the three years. But it like started out 79, then it went to 74, then it went to 71. Where the other guys are kind of like bouncing around a little bit, but showing constant improvement. Then uh, yards per catch, nine, uh, 9.3 for him, 7.9 for Levante, and 6.7 for, for Dion. And uh, yards per Yards per attempt are seven for him, 5.8 for Levante, and 6.7 for Dion. Passes, uh, pass defense, pass deflections, whatever you, whatever you call it. Um, he's got 18. Levante has 15. And Dion had 17. So, I mean, with, you know, his interceptions on top, of, like, that's pretty impressive. Like, that's really impressive that as a linebacker in the last three years, he's he's got 18 pass defenses. And then passer rating against, he needs to get this down a bit, but it's like a 104.2. Compared to Levante's 93 and Dion's 94. And then missed tackle percentage. He's uh that's another stat where you saw it go down every year. And just on average, even though he had a 5.5 last year, once you average it out from you know his first season on, it's 7.4 where Levante David here, you know, later in his career, has a uh, 7.4. And Deion Jones, actually, here, you know, after he's into the prime of his career, he's his missed tackle percentage is 10.5. So, I mean, he stacks up really well against, you know, two great linebackers. And, uh... I think Jalen Smith will be the perfect guy to pair with Jamin in the nickel. We need to sign this guy right now. <clears throat> and as far as corner goes, just like with our linebacker need, right as we need a cornerback, we get thrown an incredible opportunity at a lifeline. The Patriots release Stefan Gilmore. Gilmore's been on the pup list while he recovered from quad surgery, but he's eligible to return in week six. And if he's ready to go for week six, it could be a huge pickup for our secondary, being that our secondary is greatly in need of help with uh, Tory McTire going out for this season. We're getting really thin, and we're already having considerable amount of trouble in coverage. So, a big-time, top-tier cornerback like this could really help us out. And, uh, you know, even at his age, he's still one of the best cornerbacks in the league. And if he's healthy and we could get them both, I think that would boost us in, into, like, an almost, like, win-now level of complete. Like, I'm not sure Taylor's ready for that. But with the way the offense, you know, we're scoring, you know, high, you know, 30 points a game. If this defense could get to where it needs to be with these two guys, then we'd be just as serious as we thought we were going to be. Now, I understand that, like, he might, you know, he's after a good bit of money. He's after a long-term deal. Those are, it'd be tough for us. Like, I don't think at 31, we'd be willing to 
give him any kind of long-term deal. And so he, he'd kind of only be there to help us for a season or two. So I don't know if we want to give him a bunch of money and possibly not be able to resign some of our young players coming up and, uh, and have him to try to kind of make a push with. I don't know if we're that ready, like that close to making a push, but Jalen Smith, on the other hand, is definitely, he's 26, he's the top of his game. He's a guy that will be perfect for us to sign long term. Now, outside of, you know, Stephon Gilmore, some of the other guys that I'm going to talk about in another video, like cornerback options to possibly help, you know, ease things over with uh, Ben St. Juice coming off an of injury and Tory McTire being out for the season. There's uh, Tony Brown, a uh, 4-3 speed cornerback he played the former like star position at bama i got a video coming out about the star position and everything soon but he played you know it's kind of like playing a corner at linebacker like they do with jalen smith that's kind of what he did he's got four three speed he could definitely help this defense out too mark gilbert who that guy was set to be the next Denzel Ward, you know, before he got injured and uh, put up crazy, crazy numbers in his uh, his sophomore season. The kind of numbers that got Denzel Ward drafted fourth overall. The same kind of numbers that are going to see Derek Stingley go in the top five. He had those kind of numbers. Then he got injured twice. But he came back and, you know, he's running a 4 3 again and doesn't look like he's missing a beat speed wise, but he's sitting on a Steelers practice squad and that'd be a guy we can grab. Along with Jack Del Rio's former first rounder, Gary and Conley is a straight up free agent, not on a roster. That'd be a great guy to bring in, you know. As a temporary measure, you know, at worst, you know, to step in for Tory McTire as the backup or whatever, he's a guy I think would deserve a shot. Nikel Roby Coleman is out there on a practice squad, I think. We should sign that guy. I mean, he could help a lot. You know, not none of these guys are going to help as much as Gilmore. But, you know, it might be better in the long term for us to get one of these other guys. Tease Tabor, who was a second rounder, and he went to the Lions, so there was nothing he could do about it. And uh, now he's on somebody's practice squad, former second round talent. So, we don't have anything to lose from signing any of these guys. Like, I think the amount of money that. Gilmore probably wants, probably has more consequence than any other signings. But, you know, McTie are out for the season. We're kind of thin there now. He was already the backup. So we could gain a great talent from, from signing these guys. There are plenty of great options out there. You know, let's see if we bring in some exciting talent or... You know, we could just keep signing extra nobody wide receivers to the practice squad. We could keep doing that. You know, we could take this unfortunate situation and spin it to a very big positive as a chance, you know, to get some speed on the field behind our defensive line. I really hope we don't half step or drag our feet with with Jalen Smith like we need guys at his house today. Jason Wright, Marty Herney, and Martin Mayhew should be whining and dining him as I speak. That is a must. <laughs> I was down for us to trade for a guy of that caliber. I didn't mention him in the video, but that's because I didn't think he'd be available. Like I didn't think there was a possibility for us to snake our way in to get him, and then they just cut him. 
You know, now we can get them for nothing but dollars and cap space. You know, Stephon Gilmore, I mean, a corner is almost, like, we need more corners, so he, I'd almost consider him a must, but maybe we, we don't need him in particular. You know, this secondary is pretty bad, and he could definitely boost it up, but he's 31, and he's probably a temporary fix. Plus, he'll cost a lot of money, and like I said before, possibly keep us from re-signing our own guys. So, I'm not sure with him. I I would definitely give him a once-over, though. Jalen Smith, though, he gives us a young stud linebacker to pair with our rookie stud and boost our defense so we can run the nickel to perfection and kick ass for years to come. You know, he also would get a chance to dominate the team that cut him twice a year for years to come. So, we need to make that happen right now. Make it happen. Let me know what you guys think down below. Should we go after one of these guys, both of these guys, none of these guys, or both scrubs, we don't want them. Whatever you think, let me know down below. And uh, you guys watch this far. I love y'all. Peace.